What does it mean when the plant tag says part sun, part shade, or sun and shade? How literally should we take these recommendations? Let us brighten your day, enlighten you on the subject here on the Gardening Simplified Show, coming to you from Studio A at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Well, Stacy, it's quite easy to understand full sun for a plant or a shade recommendation. I think I can handle that pretty well. But when they start talking about part sun and part shade, first of all, isn't part sun and part shade the same thing? And this is coming from a guy who can confuse etymology with entomology, Ah, which really bugs me. (laughs) (laughs) So I guess let's start here. What kind of shade are we talking about? Structural shade, filtered shade, seasonal shade, part sun, part shade. Aren't they the same thing? I mean, I know I'm getting caught up in the weeds here, Stacey, but uh, kind of tough for me to figure those out. Well, you and a lot of people. I mean, I've definitely heard from a lot of people that they get confused. So let's just get this right, you know, get this out of the way right off the bat. Part sun and part shade are interchangeable. Okay. At least for us. So speaking for Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, the way that we use those on our plant tags is interchangeable. And we specifically opt to use part sun over part shade because the sun, in terms of the plant performance, is the more important part, not the shade for when it comes to most shrubs. So we use part sun. And what we mean that to, what, what we intend that to mean is four to six hours of sun each day or filtered light all day. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense. You know, my approach always has been, okay, if this is a sun plant and the tag says it's a sun plant, don't put it in the shade and vice versa. Uh, But as far as part shade or part sun is concerned, I don't know. I just kind of, uh, I just kind of wing it. So, um, but that description is good. As a matter of fact, in the Gardening Simplified catalog, uh, you're right. It says full sun, six hours of bright sun each day. Part shade is four to six hours of sun daily or filtered light throughout the day. And then shade is less than four hours of sun a day. And I guess that that's a pretty good way to define it. So again, in my mind, part sun and part shade are the same thing. Four to six hours of sun per day. Uh, And yet, what time of the day? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think the afternoon sun obviously is hotter Mm -hmm. than the morning sun. The morning sun is great because it dries the dew off the foliage of roses or plants, helps to decrease uh, disease. And then the next question that comes to mind, Stacey, is how do you figure out how much sun you have? Because most people do not have a light meter in their back pocket, right? And even if they did, light meters don't just say okay, your reading is full sun. They gave you it in lumens and no one, to my knowledge, has done the translation work to say, okay, this many lumens over the course of the day in a spot equals this much light. But I do think that there is a simple way that one can test it. And that is if you can stand being out there for certain parts of the day, then that is shady. And if it's hot, if you go out on a hot summer day and it feels real hot and sunny, If it's like that most of the day, you've probably got sun. If it's like that part of the day, you probably got part sun. If it's like that none of the day, you got shade. So what we're saying is that this part sun, part shade, sun shade, filtered shade, whatever, is somewhat of an inexact science like the hardiness zone map. It is an inexact science. And, you know, that's why we often say that gardening is art and science, because there is a little bit of that instinct, intuition that goes along with it. But, you know, for us, you know, being a, a company that introduces new plants and writes tags, what we're trying to provide is the conditions under which you will see results similar to the photos on the plant tag. Okay. Because that's what we really want people to, to have. I mean, if they're buying a plant, we've sold them on the plant tag, those pretty pictures. They're like, yes, I want this. I want it to look like this in my yard. Mm-hmm. And while that plant might be able to survive in 
more shade, more sun, whatever that looks like, it won't perform like we have set up your expectations to perform. And that's what's really important to us is how can you uh, recreate the conditions for the success at home? So the plant tag is there to help the plant thrive, not survive. Yes, exactly. Not just survive. Not survive just too. survive. <laughs> Thank you. Important word to interject. <laughs> Not just survive. Uh, exactly. You know, I think uh, I was thinking about this subject and I was thinking that if I were a plant, I think the tag that they would make for me and staple on the lapel of my jacket here would be sun because I love the sun. I love summer. And as a matter of fact, I wrote you a little limb a Rick about that because I'm really popping the vitamin D right now. I can't wait for spring. I'm really lacking sunlight. It's making me quite uptight. I'll pop some vitamin D and drink some hot green tea and maybe I'll be more polite. My houseplants are experiencing depression. It's causing a slow digression. And so I have conceded that therapy is needed with a sun lamp intervention. <laughs> so we're a lot like plants, Stacy. Well, I have a question for you. Yeah. So if you're talking about the plant tag you're wearing and it's yeah. full sun, what's your hardiness zone? <laughs> <laughs> I got to be a zone nine or 10. I was thinking you're going to go no tropical. I have no idea why I'm living up here. <laughs> Zero cold in... tolerance. <laughs> <laughs> it's something else. Now, of course, that does bring up a good point, and that is the sun tags and the shade tags, sun or shade or part shade, uh, it's going to be a little different dependent on where you are in the country mm -hmm. also because full sun in Georgia is going to be very different from Toronto, Canada. Absolutely. And you know what? You, we started talking about this earlier. I think it's a really, really good point. For us here in Michigan, um, most of the Midwest and certainly the North, that time of the day that you get the sun is less important. We don't have, I mean, we might have a couple of very, very hot days, but for the most part, our afternoons are not scorching or outside the realm of what most plants can take. But absolutely, when you get into those warmer climates, um, I would say basically, you know, from Virginia South-ish uh, over West um, to Oklahoma, that afternoon sun can really change the plant's ability to thrive in, in that area because it is so hot. And at that point, you've had hours of accumulated heat. And so how stressed is the plant getting? And so in those cases, you know, it does become much more important to pay attention to those shade needs. Um, and that's why plant uh, light tolerances are typically listed as a range and people often get confused, but you know, we can only have plant one plant tag for each plant. If we had them for every region, it would <laughs> trust me, it would be a mess as nice as it would be. Chaos. It would not work out <laughs> as well as it might seem. Um, and so we put that range so that people can, you know, make the right decisions. And I say this often, but it's why shopping at a local garden center is so important, especially if you aren't familiar with what you're doing or looking at new plants, their local expertise in what that plant will tolerate, how it will actually thrive and not just survive is crucial because they're the real experts. And I think Stacy's going to take us down this road in plants on trial because two plants that I think of as we talk about this topic, one is hydrangeas. Because I personally believe hydrangeas need a lot of sun to bloom well, and yet some people, Stacy, consider them to be a shade plant. Yes, I'd say they are widely considered to be a shade plant, and generally, I would say that is a not an appropriate assumption. Exactly. So we'll get into that. And then for me personally, as a matter of fact, I was just chatting with Kevin Hurd from Proven Winners about this. I remember coleus when I got uh, when I first got into the industry over forty years ago. Uh, coleus was strictly a shade mm. plant and it would be blooming its head off by July. Uh, now via genetics and plant breeding, uh, the coleus really doesn't put its energy into blooms and we can have it right out there in the hot sun. The label or the tag on coleus has changed through the years. Yeah. The coleus has changed and people sometimes do need to reconsider all of their assumptions about that because of, because of plant breeding. Yes. So, Take it with a grain of salt, apply the same principle we did with the hardiness zone map, and that is we're talking about ranges. We're talking about in the ballpark, but at the end of the day, regardless of what the tag says, the proof is in the pudding, and the plant will quickly show you whether or not it's happy in the light environment it's in. It will. And read the tag and read the labels. 
Plants on Trial coming up next. Stacy will introduce us to a plant and we'll continue our talk on this sunshade, part shade, filtered shade stuff right after this. Stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. We're going to put a plan on trial, but as is often the case, I have a few last words for our previous topic. Great. So do I. <laughs> good. <laughs> perfect. Great minds. Um, you know, we gave people a lot of good information about light, but we didn't really talk about what to look for if a plant is not in light that, okay. you know, you, you, that would make it happy. So if a plant is in too much shade, you're going to see a lack of flowers. Yep. You're going to see um, dull colored leaves. And uh, the plant is going to be more sparse and open and, not, and less dense and rounded. Those are typical signs that the plant is in too much shade. But flowering, I would say, is probably one of the biggest in fruiting if it's a fruiting plant. Now, if it's in too much sun, what you're going to see is basically an inability to keep it watered mm -hmm. <laughs> no matter what you do. Now, don't get that confused with overwatering because an overwatered plant and an underwatered plant both wilt. <laughs> but... Um, Hard to keep it watered, browning around the leaf edges and the leaf tips, um, and the plant just kind of looking sort of beige and sad. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's hard yeah. to explain unless you've seen it, but they do take on this kind of like bleached, sad look. A bleached look and burnt along the margins of the foliage. Yes, you're going to see that. Uh, I wanted to mention, uh, if you go to provenwinners.com uh, and you're looking for a plant, let's say you're looking for a hydrangea, uh, there's a icon on the uh, website that says light level, and mm -hmm. you can click on that. Now, here's the choices they give you. Full shade, part shade to shade, part shade, sun or shade, part sun to sun, sun. Yeah. The, they really break it it's down. A, it's a little overcomplicated, and <laughs> I think there's a little bit of a lack of consistency since many peop, different people contribute to that website. Right. Um, but there's lots of other places to find out. Any For the most part, anytime you find out a, a light requirement of a plant genus, so say salvia or whatever, you're going to be able to extrapolate that to most of the other members of that. Well, and, and working in the garden center, I've got to say that the tags for proven winners, color choice shrubs, are fabulous. I mean, when you're out there working with customers, anyone, whatever their level of gardening ability is, boy, you open up one of those tags, you can pretty much find what you need to know. Well, that's what we try to do. We, we want people to be successful. Right. <laughs> we really do. Uh, and uh, last word on this before we move on to today's plan on trial. If your plant is not in the right amount of light, you can move it. Yes. So it's not a forever commitment unless it's a tree and then you've got bigger problems, literally and metaphorically. Um, but, you know, for the most part, you can absolutely move that plant. Early spring is a great time to do that. You can even do that through spring or in fall whenever the plant is dormant. So it's not a, you know, life sentence if you have misplanted <laughs> your plant in terms of light conditions. So, you know, obviously all of the plants in the Proven Winners Color Choice line need light. Plants need light to photosynthesize. Exactly. It is a crucial part, although often omitted part of the photosynthetic equation. You can look it up if you are curious. Um, they don't always put light, but the photosynthetic reaction must happen in the presence of light or it doesn't occur. So, Incredibly important element. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so some people don't will skip that one. Will write light over the arrow yeah. that shows the conversion. But uh, now I'm just being pedantic, and I'm trying to say something really important about a plant here. And the plant on trial today is Fairy Trail Bride Hydrangea. Wow. Beautiful. Now you called it. You said I would probably pick a hydrangea because they are a plant that is often very confusing for people in terms of light. Now, here in our trial gardens in West Michigan, we grow the majority of our hydrangeas in full sun. So that is to say, again, at least six hours of bright sun each day. Now, that said, our hydrangeas are mulched to within an inch of their life. We have a very nice thick blanket of mulch over them, which they love because they have shallow roots. And they are irrigated. So those two things can help a plant take more sun. But that said, in a milder climate like this where our summers, you know, again, we might have a few days in the hundreds, uh, in you know, over 100, but they're, they're few and far between. For the most part, our summers are, you know, around 85 degrees, 83, 85 degrees. Now, if you live in the South, yes, absolutely. Your hydrangea is going to need shade in the afternoon because for all of their wonderful qualities, hydrangeas are just not that efficient at using water. And when they're in a very hot climate and they're in a lot of sun, they're going to lose water faster than they can replace it. And you're going to have a wilted hydrangea all the time, which, you know, is fine short term, but long term, you're just kind of like, why am I growing this sad looking thing? 
Because it's moping all the time. Yes. Yeah. Not a moped, a moped. That's my moped. <laughs> that was a good one. I'm writing that one down. All right. You can use that one. Okay. Thanks. Um, <laughs> but moped. this, today's plant on trial, Fairy Trail Bride Hydrangea, is a, it, it is a plant that has really kind of opened my eyes to the fact that a plant's light needs can be about more than just the number of hours of sunlight they need for successful photosynthesis and health. Now, before I get into why that is, I want to kind of paint a picture of Fairy Trail Bride Hydrangea for you. It's a newer hydrangea. Um, you may have heard of it. It was originally introduced in Europe as Runaway Bride Hydrangea mm. and won Best in Show at the Chelsea Flower Show in 2018. People went bananas for it. They kept saying, you guys going to have this in the U.S.? Well, it is finally here. It sold under the name Fairy Trail Bride Hydrangea because we felt like Runaway Bride was a little bit depressing <laughs> <laughs> speak now or forever hold your peace yes. and you know it's not a runaway plant it's actually a very lovely plant <laughs> it's a different type of hydrangea it's related to big leaf hydrangea hydrangea macrophylla okay um but we call it a cascade hydrangea because it has a very different habit oh. so most hydrangeas are really rounded okay uh fairy trail bride is very um horizontal and the branches almost have like a, a garland or cascading type effect so it's very very different really beautiful in the landscape. It's perfect if you can plant it like near a wall or someplace where this unique habit is really going to shine. And to make it even better, the flowers are set at every single leaf node or where the leaves meet the stems on the plant. So when it's in flower, it is just a mass of blooms. It flowers so much, mm. almost completely obscures the foliage. And this is actually one of the few, if not the only, spring blooming hydrangeas. Aha. Now, a lot of people get viburnums confused because viburnums are very much spring blooming and people think they're hydrangeas. Fairy Trail Bride's coming along to mess with everybody's expectations by blooming in late spring, but it is actually truly a hydrangea. So late spring. So if you're having a late May, early June wedding, it may be ideal. It would almost be certainly be ideal, okay. at least here in Michigan. And it does get to its name, Fairy Trail Bride or Runaway Bride, because it has beautiful pure white flowers. They are lace cap flowers. But there are mop head versions that will be on the market in the Fairy Trail series next season. So exciting. Very All exciting. Right. But you're probably wondering, okay, get to the point about the light. The show <laughs> is about light. And I have been enlightened, as it were, about this plant. So when we first introduced it, we sold it as hardy to USDA Zone 7, which is not very hardy. Most right. hydrangea macrophyllas and relatives are hardy to at least USDA zone five, if not USDA zone four. And a lot of people were very disheartened by that because it's a beautiful plant and they were super duper excited about it. But the reason that we were more conservative about its hardiness is because it does bloom earlier. And so it has those flower buds uh, on the plant in late winter and spring. And a lot of times here in Michigan, we'll get those frosts, you know, late April through Mother's Day. Seems like it never fails. We never have a frost fails. on Mother's mm -hmm. Day, almost never fails. Um, and so even though the plant could survive in terms of like actually living in colder climates, what we were afraid of is that it wouldn't bloom well. Okay. And, if, you know, we want people to be successful. So we're trying to give people the information they need to actually be successful. Well, over uh, the past couple of years, what we have learned, and this is very interesting, is that the plant is, is perfectly hardy. And yes, there is this issue of the earlier buds. But if, it, if you cite it in part sun or part shade, however you want to think about that, so we're going four to six hours of sun each day. In this case, we want morning shade for this plant. What we have found is that if you do get those frosts or freezes in spring when the plant is starting to leaf out and bud out, that that prevents the frost crystals from melting immediately as soon as the sun hits mm. it. And that slower melting that it gets just by sort of gradually warming due to exposure of the warmer air temperature reduces or eliminates the damage to the flower bud tissue. That's fascinating. You know, I think about how in the nursery industry, sometimes when we have those marginal frosty mornings or nights, we'll irrigate, mm -hmm. get a coat of ice on the plants and allow to, uh, nature to take its course. Yeah. So this is kind of the same uh, uh, concept. Okay. So we, are, we have changed the light recommendations on this plant and are specifically only recommending part sun or part shade, however you want to put it. But again, I always go with part shade, with part sun. And we are specifically recommending that shade in the morning 
so that you can eliminate that dramatic melting of the ice crystals and damage to the plant. So, and I think going with part sun as opposed to part shade is being positive. Yeah, and yeah, it's fewer I like letters. It. I like it. Oh, and fewer <laughs> letters. <laughs> These things matter when you're designing tags. So shout out to our designer, <laughs> Shannon, on that one. Um, another great thing about Fairy Trail Bride Hydrangea, it was developed by a gentleman named Ushio Sakazaki in Japan. And you may not have heard his name before, but if you have ever grown Proven Winners plants, you are you have definitely grown his work. He is the breeder behind Supertunia Vista Bubblegum. Oh, really? He is. One of my just favorite plants in some. <laughs> yeah, he is really just an absolute wow. brilliant breeder. I'll put some links in the show notes at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com so you can read more about how he managed to basically revolutionize petunia breeding. He's also the breeder of Blue My Mind of Volvulus, a plant that I really like and Beautiful. grew, uh, grew mm -hmm. a couple of years in a row. Yep. Um, lemon Slice, Superbell's Lemon Slice, Caliber Coa, and a lot of the other Vista bubblegum supertunias, and of course, Fairy Trail Bride Hydrangea because his true love is hydrangeas i'd love to meet him yeah i wow. would too way to go we'd have him on but i don't know how confident he is in his english skills and there's also a 12 hour time difference and i n i would not require him to <laughs> to join us at 1 a.m japan time to uh to to join us on the show so um it's a really incredible plant we're now saying it's hardy usda zone six to nine even five if you cite it carefully with all this information in mind Four to feet, four foot tall and wide, and really just an absolutely beautiful plant that everyone will make you. Well, everyone will say, "What in the world is that?" I need to know. And now that everybody got a raise, where we bumped up the hardiness zones a little <laughs> bit, maybe you want to try it. Yeah, you definitely should. You can learn more at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. We're going to take a little break. When we come back, we're opening up the garden mailbag. So stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's my favorite time of the show where we answer gardening questions. I love answering gardening questions, don't you? Yeah, it's fun. When people like ask you to party or, you know, like, all right, well, you better have a photo. But I, I, I do love it because um, I, I do get stumped. But I love when I'm stumped because that gives me like a new topic to explore. And I don't stay stumped for long. So That gets my stump of approval. <laughs> Yeah, outstanding. Yeah, and I love it too because it reminds us we're all in the same boat. It's so true, right? yeah. yeah. I mean, when you ask something, there's almost certainly someone else out there going, oh, yeah, I've yeah. been wondering about that too. So um, anyway, if you have a question for us, you can reach us at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. You can also leave a YouTube comment. Adriana will pass those along to us. Uh, you can put it on Instagram. There's so many different ways to reach us. So if you have a question, do ask. Spring is coming mm -hmm. uh, very quickly. In fact, meteorological spring is less than a month away. Yes, and I go by meteorological spring even though it's tough to pronounce <laughs> well you know it makes sense it's a it's a very nice tidy way to think about the season so i feel you on that so what's our first question rick all right trixie's got a timely question at what point should gardeners fertilize their gardens in spring great question my cool season vegetables are not growing very well so trixie's in zone 9a the 15-day forecast shows highs in the upper 60s with overnight lows in the mid-40s to low 50s. My average last frost is around March 10th. Also, will organic fertilizers such as Espoma start working now or do they require heat in order to release their goodness to my plants? Thanks for all you do. So I think you want to live where Trixie's living. It yes. sounds like your kind of climate there. <laughs> so Trixie, this is such a great question. Um, and I feel like there's a couple different components to it. So you have the vegetable issue and uh, fertilizing cool season vegetables is obviously going to be very different than just doing regular garden maintenance fertilization. Um, and I don't know what cool season vegetables you're growing, but certainly if you have unusually cool temperatures, um, they are going to grow a lot more slowly. And that's just, you know, a simple fact of them not being able to metabolize as effectively as they do in spring. So even if you're growing cool season vegetables, they're not going to grow like a vegetable at, you know, the height of the season. So I would recommend that you continue to fertilize those, you know, using a liquid fertilizer like you would your, your summer vegetables. But I would say probably looking at like once a month instead of every week mm. or every two weeks. What do you think? Mm. Yeah, I, you know, the approach that I take, Stacy, is I look more so at soil temperature mm. than air temperature. So Trixie's talking about frost or temperatures in the upper 60s. But when that soil temperature gets to 55, 60 degrees, if there's sufficient moisture in the soil, then I think fertilizer can be effective. Yeah. 
Definitely, definitely. Uh, so uh, speaking of fertilizer, being effective at certain points. So organic fertilizers like Espoma, which as you know, we both love. We've talked mm-hmm. about them many times. Um, they don't require heat in order to release, but unless the plant is actively metabolizing, they could release their nutrients through the process of weathering, which is just to say the acids in the soil, rainfall, water, worms and other microorganisms, all of that working together to break down the grain of the fertilizer and make the the nutrients available to your plant. That will happen pretty much as long as the ground is not frozen. But again, if it's releasing your nutri- those nutrients and the plant is not actively metabolizing to take them up, then what can happen is this the fertilizer can run off and it's just a waste and potentially polluting. Or by the time the plant is actively metabolizing, it's not that the fertilizers, the nutrients are already gone. So I do recommend going a little bit closer to the growing season. So I think probably for you, Trixie, now-ish, mid-February should be fine. Um, But the thing to consider with requiring heat for release is time-release fertilizers. So like your Osmocote, uh, Proven Winners has a continuous release fertilizer like that. Anything that's that's engineered into a prill and intended it with, if it says something like fertilizes for six months, that is a time-release fertilizer and those do release their nutrients based on temperature and they calculate that range of time based on temperature, a certain temperature. So if you live in a warm climate like Trixie does and it says feeds for six months, but yet you have a much warmer season than what was calculated, it's not going to actually provide nutrients for six months. They will actually go out sooner. Yeah, which is true. And I'm glad you brought that up because these prills are highly effective and great. They take some of the guesswork out of it. Ideal for containers or if you're container growing, some of your vegetables, or flowers ideal. And for folks who are keeping score at home, Stacy mentioned the Espoma fertilizers. So those are the tone fertilizers like garden tone or tomato tone or plant tone. Yep. Love that. Rose tone is my go-to for all shrub fertilizer needs. So you can keep that in mind if anyone's wondering that. What's our next question? Uh, Yolanda writes to us first. I'd like to say I love your show. Thank you very much. You guys are fun and super informative. My husband and I have finally bought our own home and I get to spend lots of time outside gardening. I read books, watch videos like yours to learn, but there's nothing like hands on. You're right about that. I don't use any chemicals, but I can't seem to find a solution for the white fly problem in this particular garden. I've never seen anything like it. They congregate on the salvia, tomatoes, even the mint. What's going on? What can I do? I've tried four seasons, but they seem to be multiplying each year. Help with numerous <laughs> exclamation points. Yolanda clearly needs <laughs> some help. And, you know, Yolanda is in a unique situation because most people think of white flies as just a greenhouse pest. Yes. So it can be very difficult to find good information about managing white flies outdoors. And um, they are typically an issue of warmer, milder climates mm-hmm. than us here in Michigan, but you can have them in Michigan. I had terrible white flies on my tomatoes last year, which must have certainly come from the greenhouse, but they just didn't go away. And mm-hmm. so some of my tomatoes, they really didn't do well, and I was just very disappointed in that. So it can happen. And if you have a mild enough climate, then they can keep overwintering and, and not die out. So um, most of the uh, control recommendations you're going to see do indeed recommend using something chemical. But I am going to... Uh, to put a, a, an alternative out there. Okay. And that is that white flies have a number of natural enemies. Yes. Uh, things like parasitic wasps, um, lace wings, which almost every garden in the U.S. has a good population of lace wings, and all of these beneficial insects. It's primarily the larval stage of the insect, or the baby, as it were, that controls the pests. And if you want them to be in your garden, you need to make the adults feel at home. And what that means is planting more flowers. And what a great recommendation for pest control other than to to plant more flowers. So look for flowers, especially small flowers, because these insects tend to be quite tiny. So they're not really necessarily going to make use of like a rose. They like things that are in the daisy family, which each flower is made up of a lot of little individual florets. Mm -hmm. You know, yarrow, um, also in the daisy family family um 
uh, sweet alyssum is zinnias. another good example. Zinnias. Yeah. yeah, anything with that compound center and smaller flowers, plant more. That will definitely encourage those beneficial insects, and they should take care of it on their own. And another thing you can do is if you have a really badly infected plant part, go out there early in the morning and just snip it off and exactly. throw it away. Exactly. Because they do tend to congregate, the white and, flies. And I think, uh, the great point, Stacy. and uh, I think you look for that and you... You clip off some of those uh, really infected uh, foliage leaves. But uh, the other thing to do is to inspect the underside oh, of yeah, the definitely. foliage. That's where you want to attack. And Yolanda, if you decide to spray, um, I've had some success using insecticidal soap. Mm. And if you use insecticidal soap, the key element there is not simply to spritz the plant, but again, you're going to get dirty. Your knees are going to get dirty. Your hands are going to get dirty because you got to get up under the plant. Now that is one of those easier said than done things. If I've ever heard one and they're uh, (laughs) done that, but whether you are hand picking or um, spraying, do remember they are flies. So they like to fly up if they're disturbed. But if you go out there early in the morning, you'll get them before they wake up and you'll have much better success. Sounds good. Anne has a question about a plant we love. Uh, Anne is located in Ontario, Canada, Zone 5B, and has two hellebore plants in a mostly dry, shady area. I only offer supplemental water when it hasn't rained for a week or two. They get about two hours of sunlight in the afternoon. They've been in the ground for two seasons, have not bloomed at all. Could you please advise what I should do to get them to bloom. I have some hellebores in the same situation, and I find, Stacy that in dry shade, I can grow hellebore foliage, mm-hmm. but they don't bloom well. Yet. Yeah, they aren't a plant that particularly enjoys being stressed. Right. I mean, most plants probably don't, but I very often stress my plants, and my hellebores <laughs> don't appreciate it. So, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, in, in uh, Anne did include a photo, which we'll put in our show notes. Now, looking at her garden, she has a beautiful planting of longwort and aurelia, and these are plants that I think for them to do well, you know, definitely there must be some amount amount of water because they could take far less sure. drought than the hellebore is. But one thing about hellebores that a lot of people don't realize is if you have seed grown hellebores, they take a lot longer to get to a blooming age than tissue cultured hellebores. Ah. So if you if you don't know or the plants are smaller, they just need to be more mature. Tissue culture hellebores You'll pay more for them, but they'll flower much faster. And in dry shade I've had success by simply adding organic matter. So if you can add organic matter, that's going to make a difference. Yeah, even mulch. So, uh, and have faith. This should hopefully be their year. If not, well, what else can you do? At least they have good foliage. (laughs) They're earning their keep. We're going to take a little bit of a break. When we come back, we've got branching news. So please stay tuned. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time for branching news. And Stacey, it's, well, Super Bowl time. And it causes me to think of the story of Sir Isaac Newton discovering gravity by having an apple fall on his head. Now, let me explain. There's a lot of people who do not understand or know that there is a tool, an instrument around called the Clegg Impact Soil Tester. So this is a a device where, and and the the Clegg Hammer, so to speak, takes its name from Baden Clegg, who is an Australian engineer who dreamed up this device, not with sports in mind, but basically foundations. uh, And it's a hammer or a tool that drops weight, like the apple on Sir Isaac Newton's head that is alleged to have happened to cause him to discover gravity and that weighted hammer with a sensor on its nose drops from a tube on a defined height to the turf area or to the soil and what it does is it measures the density of the soil now how does this all tie into the super bowl well in the news this past week the san francisco 49ers made it to the site of the Super Bowl game and to practice they get a field and they didn't like the conditions of Ooh. the field And I guess I can't blame them. Athletes have uh, uh, really concerns over how dense or compacted a soil is or how hard the turf is. Golfers do too. And so they use a Clegg device to determine uh, how compact or how hard the surface is. And there's your football lesson for this week. 
Uh, so did they do the Clegg test to yes. say, hey, this field won't work for us? We yes. need a Clegg of at least X number? Yes. They did. Isn't that did interesting? Did they travel with their own Clegg hammer? That's a great question. <laughs> and it causes me to believe they do. Uh, they must. Somebody around has the Clegg job, drops the Sir Isaac Newton apple and says, this field isn't going to work. And of course, you know, high concern within the NFL and in football for things like con uh, concussions, and sure. rightfully so. And so uh, I'm just sharing this with you that uh, there is such a thing as a Clegg hammer, and uh, athletes uh, have interest in it. Well, you know, I don't celebrate the Super Bowl, I celebrate the Superb Owl. The Superb <laughs> Owl! <laughs> And how do you do that, <laughs> Stacy? By, you know, looking at pictures of owls and talking about owls and hoping to see an owl. You do bird watching <laughs> on Super Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, hopefully you have some good snacks to go along with that. That's great. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Boy, you are hot <laughs> on the puns today. <laughs> Superb owl is, it's, it's a phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, uh, hey, as long as we're on the subject of wild animals, a power outage affecting thousands of customers in downtown Toronto was caused by an unlucky raccoon that wandered into the wrong place, utility officials say. So 7,000 downtown customers in Toronto were out of power last week, they determined that the raccoon had made contact with their equipment at a downtown Toronto station. Oof. Oh, that poor raccoon. What is with the raccoons in Toronto? It's a phenomenon. It is a phenomenon. It's like Toronto. there's a whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And I have tons of great raccoon puns, but they're all in the trash, so I won't share them with you. Here's a great story. I love this. A 285-year-old lemon. Oh, Can tree. you imagine that? A fruit. No, a fruit. Oh, no, I can't. A 285-year-old lemon was found in the back of an old cabinet drawer and was auctioned for $1,780 in England. So they had a 19th century cabinet that was brought to an auction house by a family who said it belonged to a deceased uncle. And a specialist was photographing the cabinet for sale when the lemon was discovered in the back of a drawer. The fruit was inscribed with a message, and it was dated November 4, 1739. And so the auction house thought, eh, all right, let's auction off this old lemon. They got $1,780 for it. I, you know, I don't know that the lemon should have been separated from the cabinet, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Good point. Well, the cabinet, meanwhile, sold for 40 bucks. What? Yeah, the cabinet sold for 40 bucks. Oh, well, But right. the lemon sold for $1,780. Doesn't surprise me. Lemons are simply the zest. And as far as this lemon from 17, let's see, it's November 4, 1739. I say bitter late than never. Indeed. Yeah. Pithy indeed. remark, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Most kitchens around the world will likely have a jar of paprika in the spice rack. But here's an interesting thing. Most people have no idea where paprika comes from. They do not. And I will admit, I didn't either. Well, there has been a bit going around on social media on exactly. this topic recently. So. Exactly. And I did, I have to admit, I didn't know. Now, I didn't think that there was some paprika tree out there. Sure, of course. Okay. But uh, when push comes to shovel, I really hadn't taken the time to think about it. And essentially, it's dried and crushed red bell peppers and other peppers, yep. right? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people were surprised to discover that it is comprised primarily of your standard red bell pepper. Well, paprika was invented so that they could liberally coat it all over the top of deviled eggs, which are about one of the most miserable, rotten things you could eat. Ooh, I controversial. Would never eat one. Yes, especially on Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> and I will not be having devil days <laughs> on Superb Owl Sunday. Wow. Uh, yeah, what does the paprika say when you knock on the door? Hold on, I'm cumin. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> I figured I'd throw a bad one in there. Okay. 
And I love this story from Bellevue, Washington. An inert rocket of the type used to carry a nuclear warhead has been found in the garage of a home of a deceased resident in Washington State. So the Bellevue police responded. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is, as you know, one of my New Year's resolutions was to finally get my shed cleaned up. Oh, yeah. And when you clean out a garage or a shed, you never know what you're going to find. And in this case, with this gentleman, he had a rocket in his garage, his shed. The bomb squad members inspected the rusting object and found it was a Douglas Air 2 Genie. The previous designation was an MB-1, which is an unguided air-to-air rocket that is designed to carry a nuclear warhead. Oh, dear. And it was just sitting in his garage. Yeah. He probably planned to do something with it, but it never took off. So uh, can you believe that? When you clean the tool shed, you never know uh, what you're going to find. And then let's finish this off here. Uh, I was so overjoyed uh, some time ago when Punxsutawney Phil uh, did not see his shadow, right? Uh, Or did he see his shadow? He didn't see his shadow, so spring is coming. It's the opposite of what you would think it should be. Okay, so he didn't see his uh, shadow, so we're going to have an early spring. Uh, This groundhog tradition is thought to have originated in the 1800s, but why should Pennsylvania have all the fun? So I just want to share with you that across the country, there are other methods of determining whether or not it will be an early spring. Oregon has the foo-foo hedgehog. Florida has a burrowing owl. Ooh, love that. Yeah. Uh, North Carolina has Penny the squirrel. New York has Cluxatawny Henrietta the chicken. Connecticut has Scramble the duck. Texas has Bee Cave Bob the armadillo. And Oregon also has Stumptown Phil the beaver. So Punxsutawney Phil has some competition for this prognostication of the spring weather. They should um, create an event where they all come together and sell tickets. I would, I would see that. Yes. That sounds kind of amazing. I love it. I love it. <laughs> hey, today's show has been a kick in the plants and happy trellis to you until we weed again. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Adriana Robinson. And thank you to you, all of you who watch on YouTube, listen to our podcast, listen to us on radio. Of course, our website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Look for us on Instagram. And for all of that, we say thank you very much. Have a great week.